Okay, so we'll continue the program. And now it's my pleasure to announce Pablo Lamata, who is working in cardiac modeling and image analysis, image processing, integrating all these things for many, many, many years, and who's currently working at King's College. So, Pablo, please. Thank you, Val. First words, of course, acknowledging and thanks to the people making this summer school possible and uh, for inviting me to talk. And um, uh, I'm coming from London. Uh, we sit in a hospital as a department of biomedical engineering, and that gives us some interesting opportunities to get a good understanding of the problems that we are facing. So the talk I'm going to give today is quite less technical compared to the previous one, but I'm going to be using those technologies of uh, numerical methods and computational sim uh, simulations. And what we're going to try, uh, what I'm going to try is to focus on a specific problem. It's a problem on how to identify when a cardiac valve is faulty or it's not working well. And that decision process of when is the best time to make a surgical intervention. So um, this is an overview of what we I'm going to be covering the introduction of a general motivation of what is the value of mechanistic models. We had Christy yesterday talking also about mechanistic versus statistical or machine learning methods. And I will make a couple of claims of what mechanical, mechanistic models brings as uh, additional value when we use them. And then I will go into the clinical motivation and how we can make this model-based data interpretation finishing on our current story of how we are making a clinical translation of these techniques. So these mechanistic models, what do I mean by mechanistic model? Is a representation in a computer of our understanding of the physics or the, of the physiology, of what, how the heart works, how the pipe works of in case of an artery. And the idea is that currently we do have a wealth of uh, clinical data. Images are probably the most visual and appealing part of it that tells us about the clinical status of the patient. And that is the information that is guiding therapy. And in general, the, the models are a step in this loop between the data and the decision that is going to help to provide additional information or a twist of the, of the gear to get a more accurate information or an additional piece of information by relating to uh, inconnected bits of, of data. Um, the compromise here is between data and models. Data is always going to be observational and is going to be patient specific, of course, and we're going to have objective metrics. And models are our understanding of the knowledge, of the anatomy, of the physiology, of the physics, and they can also be used to make predictions as we had in the previous talk. But we know we also need to be aware of the limitations of these two big um, uh, items. The data is always going to be biased, it's going to be always noisy in a bit or in a large amount. Uh, and it's going to also face issues of reproducibility, things that from the me mechanic, uh, mechanistic models we don't really, uh, we don't always remember. We take the data and we take that from granted, but clinicians are very used to realize that that very robust metric of an ejection fraction that we have heard through the summer school can have a variation of a 5, 10%, and it's not a big deal at all. And that's a big difference in terms of talking about the models. And when we talk about models, we think that we might be inclined to think that this is the absolute true, but it's an absolute true given a set of assumptions. And also we need to understand that when we make these models, there are bits of the modeling that we are quite sure that represent the, the reality of these patients, but there are going to be always parameters or boundary conditions that we are not going to be able to really control and we need to test what is the sensitivity of our conclusions given those uh, missing bits of the big picture in terms of the modeling. So in general, all my research life is about finding the best compromise between the data and the models. And if there's a take home message in general of this value of computational modeling is that they allow us to do two things. And I'm going to draw the analogy of weather forecast. In weather forecast, you can more or less now understand that it's really easy to interpret why we have rains, because there was high pressures here, low pressures there, and we can explain really well why this tsunami happened, blah, blah, blah. 
So that's the explanatory value of the model. And also we can use then the, the models to draw what is going to be the prediction. So my kind of motivation as researcher is to focus much more on the first stage of providing the explanatory values between that data and that model to improve the clinical decisions and not to claim that we are able so eagerly that it's really attractive, but not to rush too much in to prove the value of the predictive aspect of the models. General introduction finished, and now I'm going to focus on one specific clinical problem. That is the estimation of what the pressure drop is through, for example, an aortic valve. Healthy and aortic stenosed, uh, and, the aort uh, and, and stenosed valve, and uh, basically it's a gate that opens and closes, and if it's really well, if it's working, prop, uh, in, it's working well, it's going to open widely, there's going to be a lot of space for the blood to flow, and there's not going to be any problem. But if the valve is calcified or for other uh, problems, the gates are not going to open well. It's going to be a narrow area to go through, and that is going to be an, an obstruction to the blood flow that is going to translate into more forces needed to push the blood through the narrow gate. And those forces are, can be assessed and are accepted as the biomarker to stratify what is the progression of the disease. So the focus here is the pressure drop before and after the valve. I will discuss a bit later where is before and where is after, and what is the distinction between the peak and the net drop of pressure. But now, also br bringing a little bit of a wider motivation, this is a problem that is general in other conditions. For example, when we have a coarctation, a narrowing of the aorta, that's going to be another constriction to the flow, another source of this pressure drop that is going to be diagnostic that is going to have a diagnostic value to take decisions there, or in causes of chronic aneurysms or dissections. Now, how do clinicians now measure the pressure drop? The most accurate method that is understood, that is accepted to be the, the, the ground truth, is to use a catheterized pressure wire, go into the chamber in case of the uh, valve, and measure the pressure before the valve and after the valve, and with that, get the pressure drop. You can imagine that this is not so easy to do in everyday practice. It's going to have some costs and it's going to have some health risks for the patients. In the case of the heart valves, although that's considered to be the ground truth, it is not done anywhere almost because it has a 5% of risk of severe complications for those patients that already have that stenosis valve. Sometimes could even be the death. So what is the 99% of the clinical practice today is to use a non-invasive imaging, Doppler ultrasound, to capture velocity, which is the uh, physical, let's say, phenomenon of the blood, and to use some basic physics to translate the information between velocity and the pressure drop. And the rest of the talk today is going to be about this, about how to translate velocity into a pressure drop and trying to improve what is currently done in the clinic. In the clinic, there's going to be a heavy simplification of the physics, and it's going to end up in a very simple formula, a formula that is four times that peak velocity squared that's driven through a Bernoulli principle, and you can easily as assess that, orient the new probe into the jet of blood flow through the construction, and capturing those events of peak velocity. Limitations? as always in imaging acquisition, is inter-observability, intra-observer variability, and in this case, you also need to pretty well align your probe in the direction of the jet, and that sometimes is not so obvious how you're going to do it. The underlying physical principles that enable us to uh, acquire this non-invasive pressure drop measurement is the Doppler effect, as uh, we, we always experience the change of the pitch of the, of the ambulance going forward and over, um, uh, going towards you or going uh, away from you. And that is the principle used by the ultrasound waves to capture the velocity. And the other one that I already mentioned is the Bernoulli's principle that I can quickly explain intuitively into what is the force that you need to go from a wide pipe where you have a slow flow and trans transit into a much smaller pipe where you have a much smaller area, and if you want to get the same net flow, you need to spatially accelerate your, your liquid in order to get 
at the same net flow to a much smaller area. So it is like the push you need to make to your, to your liquid to go from a low velocity profile to a high velocity profile due to a smaller cross section. So that, that is um, uh, what is, uh, is accounted for in current clinical practice. I also want to drive uh, to, to briefly touch on basic concepts regarding pressure, blood pressure, because we always understand that, uh, well, I would say that a very nice analogy of pressure in a fluid is uh, the, in the concept of height in a river. So if we have a, a mountain and we have a valley, the blood is going to be accelerated from the mountain towards the valley. But the point is that we need to understand that, well, and, and in, in, with that analogy, the heart is going to be the elevator that is going to increase the, the pressure, is going to uh, take the blood particles into the mountain so that they can go down the, the, the valley. But we need to understand that the, the heart flow is pulsatile. And in the central circulatory system, we're going to go through those uh, cycles of positive and negative pressure. And that's going to translate, and this is not so intuitive, that sometimes the pressure down the aorta is going to be higher than in the heart. And I will come back to that afterwards. But just keep the picture of that transition of between the mountain and the valley and that we have some pulsatile uh, behavior. So um, the other key concept is that when we talk about the pressure drop, it's not the absolute value of pressure. We're not going to be talking about those 100 or 120 millimeters of mercury of absolute pressure. We're going to be talking about the pressure of difference between two anatomical points. And sometimes they're going to be between the ascending aorta and the descending aorta or sometimes they can also be between the ventricle and, the, and just after the valve. And mm, some of you might be familiar more with the pressure transients in time. So this is a very, uh, this is a zoom in in the area of interest related to this image. And if we have the ventricular pressure, the elevator going up and down, uh, that's the blue transient here. And the pressure wave is gonna hit better uh, earlier in the ascending order than in the descending and the, that's going to be the light blue curve. The green curve is going to be at the descending aorta. It's going to be a bit later and a bit augmented. And what we're going to be measuring here is the red difference between the light blue and the light green. It's the pressure difference between these two points. You can already see here, sometimes the pressure green is going to be higher than the, again, and the descending compared to the, ascend, to the ascending. I will get back to that point later again. And the other key concept to remember, and it's something we have briefly touched in the previous presentation, and it's basically Newton's laws applied to physics. What do we account for when we want to translate the information from velocity to a pressure drop? And we account for three main physical aspects. One is the temporal acceleration. So when we temporarily accelerate the blood as a pump, we are uh, uh, um, pushing and pulling. So we are pushing to accelerate and pulling to decelerate. But at the same time, we also have that component of the advective force that I was describing before as the Bernoulli principle. So the Bernoulli principle is a very, is a simplification of the 3D advective into a 1D scenario and accounting for those changes of uh, the velocity, the momentum of the velocity as it travels through the pipe. And finally, and that relates to the spatial acceleration of blood. And then finally, we have a component of viscosity, a, a component of friction, a component of inefficiency of the flow, of dissipation of heat. And that, uh, those are the three main terms that in the easiest or the simplest form of the Navier-Stokes equation, talking about an Newtonian flow without turbulences, is what uh, is the physics that I'm gonna be discussing today about how to improve the estimation of the pressure drop. Right? So, uh, Another important clarification is that at this, I'm not going to be talking about capturing the anatomy of the patient and then computing all the physical variables. I'm going to be talking about capturing velocity of the blood and then computing pressure. So it's not going to be a pure CFD simulation where we have the boundary conditions and going to simulate the reality. It's an observation of the flow and translating the information between velocity and pressure. So it's a model-based uh, data interpretation of the velocity. And it's, as I said before, more specific now, is a synergy between capturing the right imaging that is gonna give us the optimal spatiotemporal resolution for the problem of computing a pressure drop 
and the modeling, what is the, what is the set of other physical assumptions that I can really take here to answer this specific question of computing the pressure drop. And so, summary, the problem, obtain the pressure drop. The state of the art is either through catheters or through Bernoulli's principle using Doppler to capture the peak event of the peak velocity. And the hypothesis here is that we're going to introduce a bit more of imaging, we're going to introduce a bit more of modeling, and we're going to get more information, more accurate information of the pressure drop, and some more information. So we're going to even eventually produce comprehensive spatiotemporal maps of the pressure drop in the pipes. And we I will discuss later what the value, what the potential value of that is. And trying to uh, provide an overview of what we're talking about here. On one end of the spectrum of the methodologies, we can talk about as the current clinical practice, capturing the peak velocity event and applying Bernoulli principle. At the other end of the spectrum is what I'm going to be discussing in the first slide during the talk is to get to a quite intensive imaging modality that captures a very rich spatiotemporal resolution of velocity and is using uh, 40 flow that was discussed a couple of days ago in the, in the, in the summer school. And in between there will be other uh, formulations. So one is simplifying all the physics into just a convective uh, force in a, in, a one -D stream, in, in a single streamline. The other is accounting for the complete 3D physics for the uh, Navier-Stokes equation. And also you can even go into a fourth channel here relying much less in data and relying only on anatomy for, and relying on forward simulations. But a little bit, what I wanted to provide is the picture that there's a continuum between availability of data and mathematical assumptions, and they go hand by hand. And um, probably doesn't need to go, to go into many details here. The modality I'm even discussing for the rest of the talk is phase contrast MRI that uh, making four acquisitions, a reference, and three velocity encoded corresponding to x, y, and z directions. We can estimate, in, we can capture in about 15 minutes in, with current protocols the uh, spatial temporal resolution uh, the, and distribution of how the blood is flowing through our central circulatory system. Resolutions are about two millimeters isotropic in the best case, so keep that figure in mind. And in general, what's going to happen is that from the phase contrast MRI, we're going to go into these pressure indexes. Many times it's going to be the pressure drop, but as I will discuss, there could be many other things. And we're going to go through pre-processing some solver that is going to trans transform, convert the velocity into pressure and some post-processing in order to uh, offer those pressure biomarkers that are going to be of clinical interest. So that's a general overview. And what I'm going to discuss is two strategies to transform the information of velocity into pressure with the strengths and weaknesses. One is using a finite element method, another is using an integral formulation working with the work and energies. So these are the dry, boring slices on the just basically saying that to do, starting from the Navier-Stokes equation in the complete form, we can go through a several steps in this FEM or these uh, uh, integral formulations and to get into a tractable problem with strengths and weaknesses, as I will discuss. So, uh, starting from the full Navier-Stokes rearranging, basically we have all the information of velocity into the right-hand side, and basically we need to get solve a problem of, I have the gradient of the pressure field, and I want to reconstruct the complete pressure field. So, taking the divergence and into the weak formulation, this problem can be reformulated into a finite element solution. And by the time we published this, the methods that we were on the table were iterative methods. But basically what they do is that they get the gradient field and they, they try to build the scalar field through iterative processes. So details are in this publication, I don't want to bore about them, but at this stage advantages we brought to the table is that for those iterative methods, you needed to define what the um, boundary of the problem was in a regular grid we are overcoming th those difficulties by masking what are the uh, valid um, finite elements to, to make the computation. And we were able to include the viscous effects that so far were neglected. With this solution, uh, we went into 
the, uh, the, 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 the data we had at hand, and we proposed a new way of looking at the pressure field, at the, at the pressure data. And as I said, this is a big jump for the clinician who is a kind of uh, used to think on a pressure drop. And here the change of gears is that we want to go into the spatiotemporal description of how the pressure field happens within the aorta in this case. And the beauty here is that we can start thinking not in just the pressure drop, we can start thinking in those three physical processes or the, these three physical forces that drive the blood flow independently. Because they're gonna tell us some complementary aspects of what is, what are those forces, what uh, in the, uh, independent aspects of the pump action or the, how the blood is being transmitted through that pipe. I will come to that in the, in the next slides. First, a methodological slide here. What we get is the 4D flow sequence. So it's a 3D plus time sequence. We assemble, as I described before, the finite element method and we solve for the total and only accounting in the right hand side for the uh, additive terms of the only the temporal acceleration, only the spatial acceleration, and only the viscous dissipation. So we have the total pressure drop decomposed in three components. And the transient is gonna tell us something about the, the, the uh, temporal acceleration, and, I said so, and, and so is gonna tell us something about the inotropic state of the heart, how hard the heart is pushing, and how synchronous or synchronous it is to provide, to, to, pro, uh, to produce a smooth transition between acceleration and deceleration, or how early, how late acceleration is happening. Convective is gonna tell us about the tortuosity, whether there are constrictions or not, and whether it's tapering or not, changes in that diameter or changing in, in the tortuosity. And viscous, the viscous component is gonna tell us about the inefficiency of the system. And as you can start thinking, those are mm, correlated aspects, but not, they are, telling us independent aspects of the physiology of the pipe. So for this analysis we did, uh, we divided the aorta in uh, six anatomical regions that as described here, the sinus of Valsalva, where in between the valve and the end of the sinus, they are standing in the first part and second part separated by where the pulmonary artery crosses here, the arc, the standing aorta one and two, and three uh, with respect to the point of the uh, end of the sinus of Basalt. And an overview of how it looks like, things look like, so blood is accelerated and accelerated. So the uh, uh, transient effect, the, uh, the temporal acceleration is gonna have a big positive gradient and then it's gonna have a negative gradient. And this is a, the, the picture of how <coughs> the pressure is greater here with respect to the uh, ascending aorta. The convective forces are gonna account for the fact that we're going from the ventricle into a narrow uh, valve and then we recover a bit and when we drop some, some of momentum due to the uh, blood going out and the curvature of the arc and the viscous is gonna be dissipation due to friction. I'm gonna enter into those components a bit, uh, a bit deeper but I'm gonna offer you a more compact illustration of what those pressure maps are. So I'm gonna go from the aorta in this axis, in zero, down uh, into the, uh, the standing aorta. And uh, these two thick lines are the ones uh, um, that um, go from the, uh, let me remember here. So those are the between planes three and six. So th those thick lines are gonna be the middle of the uh, ascending and the standing, all right? <coughs> so this is how the anatomy is, def is divided in the vertical axis, and this we have time. So the total pressure drop is gonna be the addition of the transient, the convective, and the vis viscous effect, each with its own color code. And as you can see, in a healthy aorta, this is the example, most of the total pressure drop is driven just by the acceleration and the acceleration. Acceleration is, uh, systole will go from zero to 400 in this case, and diastole will go through the rest of the cycle, so there are hardly any, any pressure drops in diastole. And you can see that uh, the, uh, the timing of these events are different. Uh, in early systole, there is the, the, the maximum positive difference of pressure. Then we have the maximum negative pressure difference in a second part of systole when the blood flow is decelerating. And in, in contrast, the convective and viscous uh, events are peaking in between those two events, are peaking when the blood flow velocity is maximum. So, 
coming into a more intuitive uh, part of picture, I'm going to be comparing what happens in the ascending aorta and the descending aorta. At the beginning of the cycle, we have a positive gradient that is accelerating the blood in time. But in the second part of the cycle, we have a negative gradient that is decelerating the blood flow. So if we go into a plot where we have the pressure difference versus the distance, in, uh, uh, at the beginning of systole, we have a strong acceleration. At peak velocity, uh, when the blood is at the maximum velocity, there's hardly any acceleration. And then uh, at peak deceleration, there's a peak negative gradient. And what you have here is the error bars of nine health subjects. And this translates linking to what we show in, the, in, in, the, in, in this um, temporal transients of a pressure wire recording. If we have time here and pressure amplitude here, the blue corresponds to the positive pressure drop at the early phase of systole. The green corresponds of <coughs> to the crossing between the pressure transient at the ascending and the ascending. And the red transient corresponds to the uh, temporal deceleration. And if we compare that we did in, the, in this patient, so the healthy profiles to nine individual patients with nine uh, aortic uh, conditions, one is a bicuspic aortic valve that is going to have a narrower uh, aortic opening, another one that had an aortic dissection and was repaired, so it had a stent on, and a Marfan syndrome that they usually have a more tortuous anatomy. If we go and compare the transient uh, um, uh, component of the pressure drop we saw that in general, the, uh, these three disease uh, subjects, they had a weaker pump action. They had, uh, uh, in general, throughout all the regions, a smaller pressure gradient. And that can be also a reflection of a stiffer wall. So if you link, I don't know how familiar you are, with the uh, uh, pressure waves traveling, if those pressure waves travel really fast, it means that uh, the difference between point A and point B is going to be smaller, so it's going to be a smaller pressure drop between in corresponding to the um, transient effect. In terms of the convective effects, I already touched on them before, but this is one of the example of the healthy subject. If we start from this point of zero at the, at the point of the valve, we're going to see a drop of pressure from, from more redder to a more yellowish uh, uh, um, uh, pressures here, and up after that we're going to see a little bit of a recovery. So in this early, early phase uh, of the, or, um, from zero to that, to that point, we see a bit of the, a recovery of pressure. That is the opposite of what I described before of the Bernoulli principle, that you have a wide pipe into a narrow pipe, and now we're going to get back into a wider pipe. So we see that the pressure is recovered a little bit in the early ascending. We then see a drop between that point and that point due to some momentum loss to the, to the uh, bifurcations and the, the curvature, and then we have a small net effect of maybe some tapering, so the, 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 the pipe was a bit uh, wider here and a bit narrower here, and probably some uh, uh, small, uh, what how do you call it, the, the small arteries going on, side, on the side of the, uh, the standing out. When we compared that healthy profile to the three selected uh, disease cases, we ended up uh, identifying salient features of related to the anatomy, related to, to the fact that the pipe is not a smooth pipe. It's a, sometimes a tortuous pipe. So this was a dilated uh, ascending aorta of the bicuspic aortic valve, probably because the jet was hitting in this part of the wall and was causing that remodeling. And that translated in a quite distinct, uh, very high, small uh, uh, pressure drop at the sinus of Vasalva, which is the drop that is used to characterize the narrowing in the clinical valve, in the, in the clinical practice, I mean. We also uh, were able to identify a, a, a drop and the recovery through the vortex, and we also were able to characterize this pseudo coarctation So it's a kink at the end of the aorta, and we were all able to give a number of the severity of that kink. In the case of the aortic dissection that had the stent, and you need to believe me that the stent was starting that point, again, we were able to, to, to identify the point of the entry of the graft and to characterize what was the dysfunction of that graft. So basically, there was still a bit of a dilated part of the aorta and a narrower part of the graft, and that was characterized by that pressure drop. And in case of the Marfan syndrome, velocities were weaker 
we already saw that the pump action of this patient was smaller, but we also identify again the, and, and characterize the impact of the vortex by that pressure drop and recovery. So this convective effect, if we are able to produce these spatial temporal maps of pressure, are, is going to able to to help us to quantify the impact of this narrowing, these vortices, and this tortuosity of the flow. Basic, and finally, the component of the viscous effect is a, is a, a component of inefficient, inefficiency, is friction, and under the assumptions that we are throwing in here, which is a laminar friction only, this uh, friction is going to be higher as we have higher velocities, so it's going to peak at peak velocity, at peak uh, uh, um, uh, at the green, but we also saw that in the healthy subjects, peak acceleration was already peaking there, and the other thing that we can see is that now the error bars are much, much, much wider, so it's uh, much noisier compared to the others. And here's where we got a bit distracted. We, we saw that we were expecting that disease conditions are going to be more inefficient, but we saw that the healthy guys were more inefficient or were wasting more energy into friction. The explanation is that the healthy guys had a uh, more vigorous uh, heart ejection, and that was the main factor that were ca was captured by this uh, um, viscous component. But we need to be aware that the assumptions we're throwing here are not really accounting for this phenomenon. So it has been quantified that with the spatial temporal resolution of phase contrast MRI, we can estimate a, like a 10 or 15 percent of the real attenuation that is going on through laminar assumptions. At by no, no means we are accounting for two grand effects. So we need to be aware of what we are actually measuring and what are we not capturing. Capture. Let me check the timing. Going on. Yes. So I'm going to jump now after going into one specific kind of solver, that is the FEM solver that allows us to provide all this rich description of the spatial temporal maps. I'm going to go into another solver that is going to help us to provide a much better accuracy and precision of the total drop, sacrificing not knowing what is going on in between those two points that I want to focus on. And that's an integral way of solving the Navier-Stokes equation. So again, the picture is that I have gradient of pressure equals a right-hand side. So what do I do to make uh, the pressure difference between I and B? If you take that initial Navier-Stokes equation, you multiply by the velocity field and you make an integral of that initial equation, you end up with a balance of work and energy. And that balance of work ener of energy is that the delta P between two, two points is the addition of three energies, the rate of change of kinetic energy, the advective energy, and the viscous energy divided by the net flow. So what we're doing computationally is that from the MRI image after segmentation, we're going to define points inlet and outlet, and we're going to make an integral of how much uh, kinetic energy in frame I is, we're going to compute how much kinetic energy is in the next frame, and we're going to make the difference as a finite difference, and we are going to estimate then the rate of change of the kinetic energy. We're then going to compute how much advective energy is um, uh, entering and leaving the domain, and we're going to integrate how much viscous energy is dissipated. The key pros here is that instead of needing to make a meshing step and solving an expensive uh, uh, FEM step, this is easily solved in MATLAB in, 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 in a couple of seconds. Uh, there is no need of that computational mesh. And one important detail that is a bit subtle is that when you define that computational domain, you need to have uh, enough uh, uh, data points to build a valid element. And when we were doing this FEM computation, there was a big controversy of you have a regular grid, a square grid, but your domain is going to be curved. So to define valid computational elements, you were sacrificing quite a bit of data to define that kind of coarse grid compared to the data grid. So if we were starting by a 2 by 2 by 2 uh, isotropic resolution on MRI, we were ending up in a 6 by 6 by 6 or an 8 by 10 by 8 valid computational element, and we were losing quite a bit of data there. So there were some tricks to account for that boundary of elements that had valid data and had void data. But that, that was a bit of a challenge. And all those challenges were overcome by this. And we don't need, we only need to make some, they, they might look a bit cumbersome here, but they are really easy integrals. It's basically adding voxels, uh, voxel by voxel information. And 
in most importantly compared to the previous method is that instead of needing to compute second order spatial derivatives for the viscous component, so the, the viscous friction is all about how quickly your blood goes in this streamline corresponding to the other one and how much they, 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 f uh, they have friction against to, e to each other. If you do it uh, through this way, you only need to make the first order spatial derivative instead of the second order and that brings also some numerical advantages and precision. So with that, we, were, uh, uh, we, we did propose this improved method and we verified through an in silico workbench, uh, a CFD simulation where we had the perfect pressure drop and the perfect velocity field that we polluted with different sources of noise. We compared to the simplified the different formulations and to the FEM PPE that I described before and we, we verified that we, we got increased accuracy and increased robustness and specifically to that factor of how you segment your data. So in the, in, the previous data, in the previous step, as we all know, segmenting domains can be sometimes a bit arbitrary, a bit challenging, and it was quite good to see that in this integral way, we were much more robust to definition of the mesh, as I said, and we were uh, more, and, and the contribution of adding that extra voxel on the boundary or not to the total integral that you do through this formulation was uh, uh, much, much less important than missing the complete element of the FEMPP. With uh, this methodology, uh, with this toolkit, we went again to evaluate how Clicken's decisions are made. So we, made, we went to evaluate, uh, uh, re-evaluate this assumption that has been taken for 30 years now and of using the Bernoulli principle to estimate a pressure drop. And I'm going to go through the series of assumptions that I've taken in this principle to, to be used. But before, as I said at the beginning, I'm going to focus a bit more of what is the difference between the peak pressure drop and the net pressure drop. So what we're facing is uh, uh, the, the problem of characterizing the dysfunctional cardiac valve. We want to tell, give a number that tells how wide and how uh, uh, um, narrow that that valve is and how that affects the performance of the heart. We're trying to characterize what is the additional burden that we bring into the heart to pump the blood through that, uh, through that, through that valve. So there's a demand of the body and the, the, it's not only the geometry, but to meet that demand of the body, you need a pressure drop to go through that gate. And there are two ways of thinking about this problem. One is, so I have a chamber here and I want to characterize what's the pressure drop between before the valve and the point of maximum constriction, the, the point of m maximum yes, impairment due to the valve. That's one way of thinking of it, and that's a peak drop. And the other way of thinking of it is, no, I want to know what the burden is accounting for that and accounting for how the, the blood flow or the jet is evolving down the pipe. And that's a net pressure drop. Um, catheters are only able to characterize the net drop. You cannot place a catheter in the point of maximum constriction. It's not going to be stable. You can never place it there. The Bernoulli principle and Doppler echocardiography is measuring only the peak pressure drop and only the convective component and with a series of simplifications we're going to discuss. Regardless of those very striking fundamental differences, catheters only able to measure the net drop and not the instantaneous drop by the time average. And Doppler being able to measure only the peak drop and only the convective and with a serious assumption. Clinical guidelines recommend the use of them indistinctly and with the same thresholds. And that's, that's very striking. And it's basically telling us that, or it was telling me that there's a huge opportunity here to make a difference because they are measuring things that are completely different. But there's a very, very, very small distinction to be made. There has been a lot of this controversy. And at the end of the day, clinical decisions are based on what is able to do, you are able to do. And as I said at the beginning, a catheter is going to be really expensive or more, much more expensive and much more risky. So at the end, you need to base your decisions on what is available and that's a Doppler. But I want to set a bit of that controversy that as an engineer, you detect when physical numbers are used to take clinical decisions. And it's quite important to be aware of them. So. Jumping into the specific problem, I'm going to focus on the peak pressure drop. That is the one assessed by the Doppler Bernoulli's approach. And the, the conceptual picture is that I am somewhere in the outflow track in the, within the ventricle. 
and I want to jump into that point of maximum constriction. And I want to know what's the pressure drop between those two points. And basically, I have two ways of computing that. Computing that accounting for the complete physics using the work energy relative pressure principle, the work principle that I have described you before that accounts for the complete nervous stocks, or do it as it does, as it currently done in the clinical practice in the best way, best alignment of your probe with no inter-observer or uh, inter-observer variability. That's a simplified renewal. I'm going to visit now the assumptions that are, in, are taken to go from this formulation and this amount of data into that formulation. So we, we did this using real data of 32 subjects, and the assumption was that instead of capturing phase contrast MRI and Doppler, we were synthesizing the best Doppler data that I said is simply sampling the peak velocity event at the point of maximum constriction. And the first assumption that we visited is, was, is among the, these three components, kinetic, advective, and viscous, is advective really the one that rules and we can neglect the rest of them? And the reality is, was that yes, we can neglect it. So both in, in stenotic patients uh, that it was in group two that had the average drop currently computed as in the simplified Bernoulli methodology and group one of controls, both in the blue controls and in the red stenotic, the kinetic was much smaller than the advective and the viscous was much smaller than the advective. Note here that there's a change of scale. One peak here, 40 peak here, 40, 40, 40. So that first assumption verified with real data is true. When the blood goes from the ventricle to the point of maximum constriction, those forces that are especially accelerating the blood rules, rule, they rule. They, you can neglect the physics of the, spatial, of the temporal acceleration and the physics of the viscous dissipation. Now, the, one of the beauties of the WERP approach is that when you want to, uh, uh, to compute this advective pressure drop, at the end of the day, you, you, you want to compute how much linear momentum is entering the domain and how much linear momentum is leaving the domain. And through the uh, uh, Gauss divergence theorem, we can then simplify our data acquisition problem into only requiring, assuming that we have no loss of linear momentum through the walls, so that the walls are not that rigid, but the the change of linear momentum in the, in the direction perpendicular to the walls is nominal, and that is uh, easy to verify, that is essentially all hypothesis, then we can uh, simplify the need of data through, from needing the whole volume to only need how much linear momentum is entering at the inlet of the pipe and how much linear momentum is leaving at the outlet of the pipe. And it's, uh, there is a mathematical proof, but basically it's all about the point of that how much, uh, as I said, what was the situation in the wide pipe and what's the situation at the point of the narrow pipe? And I just need to compare those two. So the other hypothesis that, uh, the other assumption that is taken in clinical practice is that there's a pressure drop, the pressure drop between the point of maximum constriction and before the constriction. But the point of before the constriction, where do you actually fix the point? Is it at the apex of the ventricle, in the middle of the uh, ventricle, just two centimeters before the valve? That's not so easy to fix, and it's not so easy to measure. So in clinical practice, basically, they neglect. They assume that there's a, an acceleration from zero to the point of maximum constriction. And I believe it's a very sensible hypothesis, but still, we visit it too with the data. And we verify that if you compare what is the advective pressure drop accounting for what's the velocity profile 2.3 uh, millimeters we took in, in this study before the valve or the point, before the point of maximum constriction, and assuming that velocity here was zero, this is how those two pressure drops relate. Yes, you're losing a little bit, so the, 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 perf the no loss will be the green line, the, the, red, uh, the, the black line, so you're estimate estimating something slightly bigger, because instead of having a zero here, instead of, so you're, you're dropping this part of the inlet momentum, so you are, the, the acceleration from here to here is always slightly bigger than the acceleration from here to there, it's a slightly smaller, but it's a you, you can assume that or you, it's an acceptable loss. And that simplifies, again, a lot the clinical practice. And it's a valid assumption. So yes, it's valid assumption to only rely on advective drop. And yes, it's a valid assumption to neglect the proximal velocity. But what about now? That simplification of considering the complete velocity profile or only considering a peak event 
a single velocity value. And that's where things started to go a bit crazy. So basically, clinical practice is driven by a single velocity value, but that velocity value is not a good representation of the shape of the velocity profile at that point of maximum constriction. And that's introducing an uncontrolled factor of the accuracy of the pressure drop that we can account much better by capturing a bit more of the information and taking the right formulation. And in a nutshell, what is going on is that um, this is an in silico easy verification that when you have a blunt velocity profile at that point of maximum constriction, also a velocity profile that is almost flat, Bernoulli principles hold. And it's basically telling you that that point of maximum velocity is common throughout the velocity profile and is a good approximation of how much momentum is going through the valve. But when you see some velocity profile that, for example, here is parabolic, the error that you incur is that you are doubling your pressure drop. Analytic, so if you, if you estimate the pressure drop through Bernoulli's principle on a par parabolic uh, par uh, velocity profile, you are doubling the real pressure drop that happens due to the convective effects. And that's what we verified. And basically these are two of the uh, experimental data we have. This is the velocity profile of one of the controls, and this is the velocity profile of one of the stenotic patients, not the stenotic, yes, stenotic patients, again, sorry. And the differences in shape, so this is not a perfect parabola, this is not a perfect blunt profile, but you can see that the error here is gonna be much smaller than the error here. And as the severity of your disease uh, increases, the shape of the velocity profile is expected. We have not really verified that, but it's expected to start changing more from the blunt profile. So you have a variable source of information, of, of, of uh, errors. And basically, the scatter of, this, of these lines here on the horizontal line is a metric that we have already of that variability due to the fact that you're not accounting for the velocity profile. So, in summer here, a more accurate and pressure, pressure drop is possible. The cost is that instead of just needing a single peak velocity, we need more information at that point of the profile. And the future that I'm working on now is to make this happen on echocardiography. So I know that I am, uh, this information is available on the, on the magnet, but that's a modality that's not widely available. And how to best compute that spatial temporal resolution of the pressure drop is not so obvious from echo echocardiography. And the claim is that all this detail, all this rich information that we can retrieve from phase contrast MRI is slowly gonna convince the clinical com uh, community and they will accept that instead of measuring directly the pressure, making an accurate enough measurement of velocity is gonna tell us the information of pressure we need. And so this will replace catheters and be considered the ground truth for uh, pressure estimation. And those are the main values, the non-invasively compared to, to catheters, the higher accuracy and reproducibility, and the additional insights. Not all of those claims are proved yet, and that's what I'm working on. This is my advertising slide. Uh, we were given the news of a uh, 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 European project funded. We are looking for 15 PhD students to start next September, October, November. I know that you're already on your PhD or on your postdoc, but if you have, you know, people that are eager to, go to work in Spain, France, UK, uh, Norway, etc. cetera, uh, we are looking for recruit an excellent batch of students. And these are gonna be students really well treated by European Commission and having an excellent uh, training program that we have designed for them through this uh, Marie Curie action. And the last slide that is also really important is to acknowledge the people that I you work with. And in my case, as I said, I'm quite privileged to have really nice technological guys that help me to make this technological push, but also key clinicians that helped me to understand the clinical pool, what are the needs that really need to happen, and funding bodies. And uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks to you, of course. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, maybe a first question is like, you start from an observation that in clinical practice, they use the pressure drop over the valve in order to make clinical decisions. And then you say like, okay, let's find a better way to estimate this, which is I think a very good way of doing some <coughs> research. But on the other hand, it's also like the clinicians use this pressure drop because they're used to it. 
But maybe it's not clinically the most important because what's likely the case is that you don't care about what the valve looks like as long as your ventricle can cope with it. So possibly rather than the spatial gradient of the pressure, the combination of spatiotemporal relations might be more interesting. So do you think you can get more information out of there? And should we also drive it from the engineering side and say like, look, maybe this might also be interesting rather than trying to reproduce what clinicians are using at the moment? Um, yeah, quite good point. The decision is not only driven by what's that ex additional burden that the heart that the valve brings is also related to how well the ventricle is able to cope with that additional burden. And this is not the complete answer to, or is not the only number needed to take the decision of the, for example, when to make an implant of a valve. So um, it is uh, the, the energy or the, the drive here is basically to improve that number. And it's basically, as we have been discussing yesterday specifically, talking with the regulator to, to the FDA, the best way to, 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 to improve clinical practice and to have an approved protocol is to replace something to something better. So from that perspective, I know I, I want to think that it's a sensible approach, but I know this is not the only one uh, piece of the picture to, to take into account to take that clinical decision and, and accounting for how well the heart copes I'm not so sure whether that acute picture, that uh, instantaneous picture of how the heart pump is functioning is gonna give you that information and probably you need some longitudinal data and then accounting for some longitudinal data maybe on the remodeling of the heart, how the heart is changing is that complementary picture or that complementary information. Any other questions? <laughs> Just wait for the microphone, please. Uh, I used to think that the gold standard for a pressure drop is the catheterization, but you say it's not right. But clinicians, I think they only think that the best way to measure pressure drop is catheterization. So do you, have you ever tried to validate your model with this measurement? So the, the answer is, is not simple. And the answer is related to that the extinction between the peak and the net drop. I was trying to make clear. And it's also the, the distinction between the absolute and the relative pressure. And it's related to <laughs> the abuse of some nomenclature that it always happens. So for example, the, the, the clinical guidelines refer to a pressure gradient. A gradient is a drop of pressure versus distance, but the measurement is the drop is not the gradient. So there are all many, many confounding factors here, but the, in, the, in the nutshell is what is the gold standard? What, uh, sorry, what is the ground truth here? And the ground truth they accept more is the physical reality of the wire. But even the pressure wire has many limitations of stability and you need to fight with not the on, not only with the with the obvious and I, I would say objective reality, but you also need to fight with the uh, accepted reality, let's say. So exposing these limitations, we have published also how when you insert a measurement device in a narrow anatomy, you're gonna make, you're gonna distort your measurement. You're gonna introduce art artifacts there. So I'm not, I don't have an obvious answer, but yes, I have dealt with the obvious uh, questions of how do you validate these numbers. And when we are uh, publishing this in, in CIRC Imaging, we were asked about this in details and basically bringing the evidence that no matter what the actual pressure drop is, the evidence we are bringing on the table is that we have these experimental velocity profiles and with these experimental velocity profiles, if you account with this formulation and you account better for the physics, you get the bias. So that was the evidence that was enough to convince that so something was going on here. Now the additional evidence in real patients with aortic stenosis with a pressure wire is not gonna happen. And if it happened, it was not gonna answer the question because we were missing two physical different things. One is the peak drop and the other one is the the time integrated systolic peak drop and the other one is the time integrated net drop accounting for different physics. We will never be able to prove this with a pressure sensor in the real patient. So that's why we're planning to do phantom verification where we have the measurement system part of the actual, let's say, narrowing in a way that it's not changing the, the physics with and without the measurement. But 
when you translate in the clinical field, you I think it's one other thing you you have to to do because. It's uh, they they measure the pressure drop with the catheterization. Then they say, okay, we're gonna intervene in this and that. So I think it's one of the best step you can do for. for be in mind that 99% is a Doppler effect. Catheters are gonna be used in very small locations. Catheters are gonna be used. Yes, as a, 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 a ground truth, but. Uh, the community is now widely accepting that they don't need to account for all these physical details and they can sim heavily simplify it into that. And the claim here is that simplify a bit less, account a bit better for the physics and you will get a better number. So that claim is not so different to what they're doing now. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to move on.